All right. Well, hello and welcome, everybody. I'm Jesse Powell. I, I apologize. You don't get to see the lovely face of Dr. Lecher here this morning. Um, I'm her Providence Portland counterpart and want to welcome you to our final grand rounds of the 2020-2021 season. And uh, it's, as you know, been a, a learning experience and, a, and a, um, a chaotic experience with everything going on, but we feel like we've actually managed uh, these grand round sessions pretty well and we're proud of the content that we've been able to produce and are so so grateful for you all joining us uh, in this uh, in this experiment with virtual online grand rounds. Uh, I do want to say we'll have a break over the summer and then we're planning to return in September on September 7th with what we hope will be a in-person lecture, kind of like we did before. So a Tuesday and a Wednesday lecture at St. B's and, and Prof. Portland, respectively. Uh, that being said, we do expect to mostly still have a online format through at least uh, end of 2021, uh, with several of, especially the visiting lectures and the guest lectures, the chair speakerships, uh, uh, live and in person. So we're doing our best to bring back uh, in-person grand rounds, but we uh, appreciated the survey that everybody filled out and we uh, we can tell that uh, having recordings is valuable. And so we're also going to continue that for those that can't attend in person. So we'll, uh, we'll look forward to having you join us at that time. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our, our final speaker of the season and um, uh, a, a speaker that I'm very excited about. Uh, uh, Dr. Nick Boncher joined us uh, about a year ago, 2019, I think, for one of our most popular grand rounds ever, and we were super excited to have him back. <laughs> uh, Dr. Boncher is from Michigan, attended University of Michigan for his medical school, and then he did residency in urology at Case Western Reserve in Ohio. He also did a fellowship in male reconstructive urology and prosthetics. And he worked in New Mexico before joining us here in Portland. He works at the Providence Urology Clinic East. His partners, Dr. Gunselman, Dr. Gillespie, uh, treat all variety of urologic uh, problems. And we've been uh, so grateful to have his expertise and his uh, uh, method of teaching that is accessible and interesting. And uh, we're just so pleased to have him here with us to uh, finish out the season. And he's going to be talking about voiding dysfunction. Welcome, Dr. Boncher. Woo. All right. Uh, thanks, Dr. Powell. Uh, I just want to uh, give me a thumbs up if everyone can hear OK. Yeah, OK, great. Um, I, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be with everybody this morning. Uh, virtually is, is challenging, and I think there are people who clearly have navigated this better than myself. So I'll try to make it seem like I'm not just talking at a computer screen um, and uh, maybe I'll get some butt in from Dr. Powell if things aren't going well. Um, feel a lot of pressure that this is the last grand rounds here, um, but uh, I'm, I'm very excited to be part of the you know, medicine curriculum and, and be working together collectively with all y'all and I think that communication is really great for our patients. So uh, I am going to talk about voiding dysfunction today. Um, it is an interesting topic to me because it is a, a scenario where the dysfunction is entirely predictable if you understand what the normal function is. And so plan to go through some of the normal functions just at the lower urinary tract, some anatomy there, and then we'll talk about some of the specific uh, pathological conditions and, and what we do to work those up and, and how we treat those, or at least how I think about them. Um, as noted, I feel like I'm increasing the number of places that I've been at, trained at, or worked at, and, and hopefully this one will be the last one. Uh, but I have uh, spent some time in the Midwest where I grew up, as well as uh, down in the Southeast, which was a, a great experience uh, working down in New Mexico and uh, a great bunch of people down there. Um, and I moved up here um, to follow my wife, who's a dermatopathologist at Kaiser. Um, and I have been so grateful to be part of the Portland Urologic Network, of which not just our group, but I think all of the groups here do a great job uh, uh, working together collaboratively despite working for different folks. And so I think it's a lucky place to land. Um, 
lower urinary tract symptoms. Uh, uh, it, it's it's a, a collective bunch of symptoms which are, are really work well for jokes, but they make a big impact for patients and their quality of life. So some of you have seen this before. This is one of my, my favorite slides, um, the Dos Equis guy. Um, and I assume that there's raucous laughter going on in the background here. Um, but I think it is, even though it's silly, it really does underscore how patients really can end up living their life. And it's a, it's a slow, steady, uh, uh, grind sometimes from normal function to pretty severe dysfunction, but because of the rate of it, patients just get used to it. And and you, they, you may look at somebody and they really look put together just like this gentleman does, but they're actually dealing with a lot of frustrating changes in how they manage their life. They you know, stop at the beginning of Walmart or the grocery store or the hardware store or wherever they're going, use the bathroom, do their shopping, use the bathroom on the way out, limit where they go, limit what they drink, when they drink, and all these different things that I think we take for granted when we're young or, or when we are healthy, but really end up managing your life. And, and so it is a very big deal when you can restore that. And it's a lot of fun, actually. Um, oops, wrong way. So the initial evaluation, and I feel like this is a slide that sort of everybody thinks about when they're looking at a problem. But for me, it's the history, the physical exam, and then my, my various tests to try to figure this out. And the key components, just like everything else, are, you know, is this something that's acute? Is it chronic? Does it happen during the day? Does it happen during the night? All those sort of things we learned about in our history of present illness. But I, I really pay attention to a couple of things right out of the gate. And, and that's, is this a behavioral thing? Um, and I think that we're seeing uh, COVID uh, allowing a sort of natural history or maybe unnatural history evaluation and, and seeing the changes of people's lifestyles magnified. And, and so I think people working from home or being at home and, and not having places to go, I've noticed that it's very easy for people to fall into a trap where they just always have something in front of them and they're always drinking. And so I'll see, for instance, some people come in, especially some young folks who are, are here for frequency and we find out they're drinking 160 ounces a day. And, and, and it's not something that generally I would experience, but I think having that anxiety at home or having a coffee pot at home or or just being there sitting it's very natural for people to have a glass of something nearby and every time they get a little thirsty they drink something and so behavior becomes something that moves to the forefront and then i think the other thing that's very important for me is is this primarily an issue of nocturia or, or nighttime frequency and Typically, if there's a difference between daytime and nighttime, where folks are not having a lot of problems during the day, but they're getting up, you know, two, three, four, five times a night, that's suggestive of a different problem and not typically suggestive of an anatomical problem. And we'll get a little bit into that later. Um, from a physical exam perspective, really, it's not a lot. I, I, I wish I could sort of be one of those great physical exam doctors who sort of, you know, listens to the heart and is like, you have the aortic stenosis and, you know, this or that. But, but for us, it's really more or less just making sure anatomically things look relatively normal. And, and for men you know, doing a prostate exam and making sure this isn't prostate cancer. Um, and then just looking at the meatus and just making sure that this looks like an open meatus. And then secondarily, I think what I will look for always is the presence of lower extremity edema. And that's because, and again, we'll get into this a little more, it really does contribute to nocturia and folks will just build up fluid throughout the day in these lower extremities. And then at night, they may make two or three liters worth of urine through reabsorption. And of course, that person's going to get up no matter what you do, because that's a lot of fluid. Um, in our office, the basic initial tests are ruling out infection. And for the most part, we just screen for it with a urinalysis, just like y'all do. And then my other big test is a post void residual volume. And in your own offices, 
this may be something where you have this this tool, this bladder scanner. Uh, but if you don't, you can always get an ultrasound, albeit with a little bit of delay. But most of the ultrasonographers and, and the radiologists will get a post void residual volume on a, just a regular abdominal ultrasound. And certainly if you specified it in the text, you, you'd get that. So if this is something that you want to take the you know bull by the proverbial horns, and uh, try to go as far as you can, I think that's a really helpful collections of things to just sort of immediately look at and try to get when you're figuring this out. Um, as I mentioned before, Nocturia, I think, warrants its own special uh, place in our, our evaluative workup, and, and that's because it is so bothersome to folks. Um, my kids are almost five and nine, um, we did recently get a COVID puppy, and so I was up a bunch, uh, especially at the beginning of that, and it just it became so taxing. I was so tired and irritable, and you realize sometimes there are folks who will get up every night, three or four or more times per night, and and that's really uh, can affect everything in their life. It's sort of a a pan awfulness because it's not only frustrating to get up but it means they're not getting restorative sleep and all the other things that go along with that. And so, you know, I think you look at this person and we've all felt that way, but imagine feeling like that for every day for the rest of your life, and that would be a really big deal. Um, there have been some good surveys suggesting like what level it is that people are irritated, and it's almost uniformly once a night, everybody can deal with that. And once it gets more than once a night, it starts to be bothersome for most people. And oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, this can be related to a production phenomenon. So I, I, I talk about it like throughput. You know, if your bladder holds, let's say 10 ounces and you make 40 ounces of urine at night, you're gonna get up four times, even if that system works perfectly. And so, I've just listed out here the things that I ask about or try to review either directly with the patient or or through some other tools that we'll get into and try to figure out are these one of the issues that may be contributing to this patient's nocturia and, and so I sort of touched on the water and I think that's a big one especially in young people but also in a community like we have here in Portland where people are very health conscious and there are a lot of, I guess, call them myths, but I don't think particularly bad myths, but about how much water someone should drink in a day. And, and there really is no magic number. And the, you know, the example I give my patients is if you look at dogs or animals, certainly a small you know, Shih Tzu is not going to drink the same amount of water. I mean, look at the water bowl versus a, a Great Dane, yet they're both dogs. And, and we have this idea that there's this magic seven glasses is sort of the magic number I hear. Seven glasses of water is what you need. Well, it doesn't make sense if you're Shaquille O'Neal or someone like me, realistically, we don't need the same amount of fluid. And so if you're a small person and you're drinking a lot of fluid, you're gonna go a lot. And seven glasses a day may not be an adequate amount for someone who's exercising or is just a big person. And so, it is an area where sometimes we'll just see people drinking a lot because somebody told them or they read somewhere that it's good for them to drink X amount. And it's again, not dangerous typically, but if you drink a lot, you may end up voiding a lot. Uh, caffeine and alcohol, of course, these are diuretics. It's something that you all understand. Uh, patients don't often understand what a diuretic means, and they may not understand that caffeine or alcohol are diuretics. So these are people who have a beer, a glass of wine at night, or maybe a couple, or they drink a bunch of caffeine in the morning and assume that 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 the caffeine is out of their system, but its effects may linger even overnight. Uh, this is, I think, probably again my primary source of of nocturia is is feet or ankles that look like this, and and that's a ton of fluid. And y'all see this with CHF and how much weight a person can drop when they're getting diuresed. But some of these people are essentially self diuresing just with positioning every night. And then, of course, as with everything, the iatrogenic cause, our, our own fault. And sometimes it is a simple thing, just the timing of a dose of Lasix or, or Bumex or one of these other drugs uh, that can make a big difference. So when you educate patients and say, you know, with Lasix, for instance, hey, you're going to have 
four hours of a lot of frequency when you take this, um, your options are to take it, you know, in the evening and get it all out before you go to bed. But if you do it at nine o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night, you're going to be up a bunch. And then, of course, diabetes, I think we all understand that that can present with polyuria, but of course, incomplete control is really going to continue to present with this polyuria presentation. And, and, and you know, I don't need to go into that pathophysiology with you guys, but uh, it, it's certainly the things we think about. And then finally, it's interesting, there's there's becoming an increasing amount of data on what happens as we age. And there is this condition, especially as folks get older, where they have this nocturnal diabetes insipidus, where they're just not producing or not responding to ADH appropriately. And there'll be this concentrating challenge at night and, and folks will just make a lot of urine, not through any of these other sort of pathophysiologic phenomenon, but just because of a loss of that function as they get older. And so again, I, this is someone I'm thinking of who's telling me I'm getting up three or four times a night, but during the day I go every three to four hours without urgency, I've got a good stream and sort of no other complaints. And I'll, I'll start thinking through this differential. And then anyone who's probably sent me a patient has probably gotten an annoying uh, response from me asking them to do more work to look at sleep apnea. And sleep apnea, I see it, it's sort of, you know, everywhere. As folks get older and gain weight, I really see a lot of it. And it's got an interesting impact on nocturia from a couple of reasons. Um, it's amazing that many people with untreated sleep apnea will get up four to upwards of seven times a night. And, and this is an average. And so you imagine, of course, there are some people who are only getting up once or twice in this group, but that means there are some people and a lot of people who are really just getting up a ton. And it's interesting that if you get them on a good CPAP or maybe even a BiPAP if they need it, you can virtually eliminate this phenomenon. So it's really a non-urologic cause and treatment. And not only, you know, do you see the benefits with the nocturia, do you really see the benefits that you guys are used to talking about, the cardiac benefits and other things. And, and the way this works is, is through, and I'll get into it a little bit more detailed, but what you get is you, you get increased venous return, and, and that's due to the pressure changes that happen when folks are apneic. And that increases the production of some of these pro sort of diuretic or, or, or pro uh, polyuria hormones, which result in an overproduction. But you also get it magnified by this poor sleep, these, this shallow sleep where folks are much more likely to wake up from any sort of bother. And so they may be getting up when normally they would sleep for another three to four ounces worth of, of filling. And so when you, when you add these together, it can really make for a miserable experience. Um, I'll put this slide up there for, for those who really are interested in, in the physiology of things. Um, what you'll see with this uh, sleep apnea is you have this increased uh, pressure gradient uh, uh, and it's primarily driven by the, the chest cavity expanding and creating that negative pressure, but not having it relieved by air coming in. And you can see that the magnitude difference, you know, normally I was surprised when I read this, it's really a, a very small amount of negative pressure change for normal respiration. You know, as few as one to two centimeters of water allows you to breathe. But the, the magnitude of pressure that happens with these sleep apnea patients may be 80 or 90 times that. And so that really changes what's happening inside that closed box in the chest, chest cavity. And so, you get these, these combining effects. You get left ventricular afterload, you get increased sympathetic tone, which is furthering some of that afterload. And then you get this increased venous return because it's a low pressure uh, sort of sink for the, for the vena cava to dump fluid into the right heart. And so you actually get this stretch phenomenon from the increased venous return, but also from the chest cavity sort of pulling or prying apart the, the right side of the heart, and that release, releases this hormone called atrial natriuretic peptide. And that hormone is normally produced 
when there is somebody who's got a lot of uh, Venus return. So, so normally it may happen, let's say you, you were out and, and you were one of these people who was over drinking and, and you had all this fluid getting absorbed into your stomach and into your vasculature and that would be this sort of roaring amount of, of uh, fluid coming back through the IVC and it would stretch from the inside, sort of pry apart that, that, uh, that cavity inside the heart. And that would result in the heart saying, oh, wow, I, I have all this venous return. I must be overhydrated. I don't need it. Let's get rid of it. And you can see what happens with, with this hormone. You really get this sodium clearance. You get an almost four magnitude increase in water clearance. And, and so you get this rapid GFR increase again, at the worst possible time for these folks. They're asleep and, and they just want to stay asleep and yet they're making a ton of urine, you know, four times normal. But in addition, you have to remember under normal circumstances at nighttime, not only are you normal, but you're concentrating your urine. So it may be even more than that because you're not getting that concentrating effect, but you're also getting a three to four times normal increased dilution. And so these folks will, they, it's incredible how much urine they may make. So that's sort of my plug for, you know, if you're, you've got someone thinking or complaining about nocturia, I really ask them about, about snoring or if their partner's there, ask them. And, you know, if you see that their BMI is 30 or 40 or God, even more than that, and these, these people probably have an element of, of obstructive sleep apnea. And, and it would be great if that were identified and you could help them with their nocturia. But more than that, you you know, you may save their life. And, and that's obviously a really big deal. Um, all right, so that's my that's my plug there. Um, <laughs> this is my reminder. My wife would love this. I have this big old college stereo system that my wife thinks is heinous and I can't bear myself to get rid of. Um, but uh, anyone who's a little bit older um, may remember that you've got these stereo systems and they're built on a bunch of components. And you've got a tape deck, you've got a receiver, you might have a CD player, you might have a record player, and then you've got all the speakers. And the urinary tract is similar and that is a bunch of individual components working together. And it's also similar that if you're having dysfunction in one of those components, obviously everything is not going to work perfectly. And so I think about the anatomy as these series of components and I try to imagine, is there function or dysfunction happening at each of these steps, right? And if there is dysfunction, these people are gonna have symptoms and they're gonna be frustrated. And so if we start back at that slide here and work our way up, I don't know if you guys can see my pointer, but we're gonna start at the bladder and then work our way down the urethra through the prostate in the men and, and then you know just the rest of the urethra and, and sort of the urinary sphincter right here. That, that's sort of how I think about it too, just follow the path of the urine. The bladder, it has two roles. It stores urine and it's a pump. It pushes the urine out. And so the, the sort of dysfunction mirror of those, of those functions are overactive bladder or a bladder that doesn't allow a patient to store urine adequately, adequately. And then also atony or what I'll often call diminished contractility or, or a poor pump. It just doesn't squeeze well. Um, the outlet is made up of the prostate and the sphincter and the urethra. And so in, obviously women don't have a prostate, but in men, the prostate is, is BPH. And of course, as that prostate grows, it can grow outwardly and inwardly and, and cause this sort of increased resistance to flow. Uh, but I think we of, often forget about the sphincter as a problem. And, and we see this much more frequently in women who have stress incontinence, and that's just an inadequate sphincter. But we can also have the, the converse of that where the sphincter just doesn't relax. And we can see this as a result of a, of a neurologic problem. Uh, we see it in MS a lot where, where they have this dyssynergia where the bladder will squeeze and the urethra will squeeze. And of course, nothing will come out or very little will come out. But we can also see it sort of as a function of the pelvic floor because the sphincter is part of that overall muscular group. And, and if people can't relax their pelvic floor, then they will have 
difficulty emptying. And this at the extreme end, we'll see it even in pediatrics, and that's that's dysfunctional elimination syndrome. These are people who have constipation and they have urinary symptoms. But those those kids with DES, they often grow up to be adults with DES. It's just they're not having a parent monitoring them. And so I think these are a lot of times the younger men or the younger women who have urinary symptoms, they have constipation. And I think it's really important to evaluate uh, and, and touch on this, this defecation habit because it often is really related. And then uh, the urethra, of course, is the final component. And, and in men, the, we'll often see this, or not often, but we will see the urethra as a source if there's a urethral stricture or, or a, just a narrowing or a scar in the tube. But in women, we can see pelvic organ prolapse actually bend the urethra and you can think of it like if you took a straw and I hope you can see my hands uh, I'll take my cord if you take a straw and you bend it in half you can kink it and, and as as the bladder sort of falls with prolapse it can drag that urethra into a kink situation as well and then we talked about throughput and then those are not anatomical but those are sort of the functional things so so in my mind this is what I'm thinking about uh, and, and I threw a couple other things in here for nocturia. You know, sometimes if you ask a patient if they get up at night, they might say, yeah, I get up three or four times. Uh, and they may end up in our clinic and they say, oh, I get up three or four times because I the dog wakes me up or, or whatever, but they're not waking up to void. And so I think that's important just to sort of make sure that it's a, it's a bothersome thing or it's a reason that they're getting up is that they have to pee and not that they're just getting up for some other reason. We'll start with the bladder. Um, functionally, the bladder has, for the most part, a couple different neurologic phenomena happening. The first is, of course, the bladder's ability to squeeze. And, and that is, for the most part, managed by choline as a neurotransmitter. And that's, of course, the reason why we use anticholinergics. But interestingly, as your brain matures, when you're, when you're a little guy or gal, it's the development of what I call the leash signal that really helps maintain continence. And so this is uh, this sort of tonic or constant neurologic signal that's coming from the cerebral cortex and increasing bladder, neck, and urethral tone and actively inhibiting bladder contraction. So it keeps people from having this sort of spazzy bladder. And at baseline, the bladder will start to, to contract anytime the pressure starts to rise. And so you'll, you'll see that if you've ever had little kids or babysat for little kids, um, when you're changing their diaper, they, you know, they could pee on you at any moment. And that's because their bladder doesn't fill to capacity and then empty to completion. They've got sort of this overactive bladder at baseline, and it's not until their, their brain develops this leash signal that they can maintain continence. And so we'll often see that leash signal be lost with, with things that affect the brain or, or affect that spinal cord pathway. Um, there is also this, what we call the bladder to bladder reflex. So it's, it's, it, you know, it doesn't involve the brain. It's just this reflex arc where we can see pain or inflammation. And this is what we'll often see with urinary tract infections. It'll just you'll get irritation at the bladder and it'll actually result in a, a bladder contraction. So there is some, some reflex issues there too. So in, in normal voiding, the sequence of events is that the first thing that happens is, is the cessation of this leash signal. And then the bladder neck opens and, and then the bladder contracts, then the cholinergic response sets in and the, the sphincter of course is relaxing if there's a prostate involved, there's actually some relaxation that happens here too, and then folks can void. So when I'm thinking about different conditions that a patient may arrive with and how that may affect just their bladder, this is what I'm thinking of. Do they have diabetes? Because diabetes can result in neurologic changes that interrupts that leash signal. Um, and it also can result in a, a polyuria from just too much glycosuria. Uh, it's interesting that chronic bladder outlet obstruction can actually change the bladder. If we go back a slide, we can see that uh, the compliance of the bladder can change 
with collagen and elastin content changing with chronic bladder outlet obstruction. And I think, you know, hopefully the cardiologists aren't watching too closely, but I think we probably see a lot of these parallel changes happening in folks with chronic untreated afterload or hypertension, where we see changes in the way that pump is physically made up from a collagen or, or a, 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 a physical makeup. Uh, we talked about some of the aging changes that can happen. And then I really pay attention to these neurologic conditions because almost all of those uh, CNS disorders will develop this overactive bladder. And a lot of it is just that loss of that leash signal. So if you see someone who's got MS, history of stroke, Parkinson's, traumatic brain injury, a lot of these folks will have this urgency frequency phenomenon and, and much of it is, is probably related to their brain and to the loss of that signal. Um, pelvic surgery, of course, uh, can make a difference uh, in the things that we do. And it's interesting that both prostatectomy, but definitely colectomy, so for, for colon cancer or back surgery, that can really affect the nerves that control bladder contractility. And, and, you know, we see contractility changing a lot. And you can see when folks are young, they usually have a pretty good strong bladder. But as they get older, especially in men, but also in women, they lose that push power. And so it's really important for us as urologists to look at the age of the person and the other conditions, because in addition to having other issues, they just may have a bladder that's not that great. And it's helpful for prognostic sort of discussions. I think what we most often see in the bladder though is overactive bladder. So again, this is an inappropriate uncontrolled bladder contraction. It, it will immediately result in a pressure change inside the bladder. And a rise in the bladder pressure is actually the afferent signal that you have to pee. And so if you have pressure rising, and you're only three to four ounces into, into filling, and also you get this big bladder spasm, the pressure will go up and immediately that patient has the feeling that their bladder is full. And it's a real feeling. It's just an inappropriate signal that's not reflecting reality. They're not a full bladder, but their bladder is under pressure. And if that pressure is sustained and the amplitude is strong enough, they're gonna leak because the bladder is a bigger muscle than the sphincter muscle. And then you know you get what we call urge incontinence is sort of the extreme end of OAB. Uh, it's interesting, of course, that OAB, although it's often sort of classically urgency and frequency, OAB can mimic BPH. And, and so it can have a lot of these same symptoms. And this is where things get complicated. It can have a lot of these same symptoms, again, if you're having this OAB happen at low bladder volumes. So sort of the classic scenario is you get a, a man who's 58, let's say, and he says he's got slow flow, he's got frequency, he's getting up at night, he feels like he's straining to void, and he feels like he empties not well. And it sure sounds a lot like BPH. But what is happening, again, to sort of use that same example, Let's say at three ounces of filling, he gets this spasm reliably. Well, three ounces, it doesn't take long for you to fill up three ounces. So it may only be a half hour or so since you just void it. And so patients will intuitively think, I must not have emptied well because I'm back in here in only a half hour. But the reality is they emptied fine perhaps, but they're having this OEB phenomenon early in filling. And of course, if you don't have much in your bladder, it's hard to get a good flow. You know. If if you gave me a urine sample and then a half hour later I said I need another one, well, you might be able to give me some urine, but you're not going to have a great flow. And the same for these folks. And then, you know, the OAB can get them up at night and it can be a really strong, a really strong and powerful sensation for these patients. So they'll, they'll sort of get this urge, they'll, they'll run to the bathroom, I, you know, to ask patients, are you pushing kids out of the way to get there in time? Um, but if they don't have much in there, but they have this strong urge, they may end up sitting in there for a while, straining to void, and, and it really sounds like they're obstructed, but they really are just getting these false alarms. And so the treatment out of the gate for this is, is overactive bladder medications. And, and typically these are anticholinergics as first line medications. Um, and these of course come with all the things we learned about anticholinergics, dry mouth, dry eyes, 
there's in, increasing data, unfortunately, that long-term use or even use in the elderly may cause some confusion. It may overlap with some Parkinsonian medications. And so they are a good first-line treatment, but we're finding that they may be uh, increasingly risky for some folks. Um, our newest class, which isn't that new anymore, is beta-3 agonists. And so, so this is actually sort of uh, reinforcing that leash signal. So it's it's actually actively promoting relaxation. And these are, are, are for the most part, pretty well tolerated, but unfortunately they're pretty costly and they're still uh, not generic. And so I have a lot of patients who unfortunately can't afford them, even though they do well. And this is medications like Mirbeltric. Um, from a surgical perspective, we have some other treatments. So, so not just anticholinergics, not just Mirbetric, uh, but, but we have two other sort of mainstays of our OAB treatment. And the first is Botox. And I think a lot of people probably have seen this slide in some form of one or the other, just about how Botox works. And it uh, changes the snare protein so that you can't get release of the neurotransmitter at the synaptic cleft. And so essentially what we're doing is we're intentionally paralyzing the bladder and we're injecting Botox. It's a, a 10 to 30 injections of one ml of, uh, or, or 10 units each injection. Um, and we're injecting the bladder wall endoscopically through a cystoscope. And, and so we're sort of trying to paralyze it enough that there's not so much OAB, but hopefully not paralyze it so much that they can't pee. And, and so you can see that reflected in that risk of acute urinary retention or AUR. And that can be up to a quarter, especially in men because of that longer urethra and the increased resistance that that provides. Uh, but this medication is pretty good. It does decrease the reduction uh, or improve the uh, voiding frequency or the leakage amount or pad number by up to 50%. So it's a pretty powerful weapon but it does have some real risks. And unfortunately it doesn't need to be repeated just like all Botox every three to six months. Um, inner stim is sort of our other non-pharmacological treatment for OAB. And, and this is a really fascinating surgery. It's, an, it's a neurostimulator called sacral neuromodulation. And when my patients ask me how this works, I often just sort of shrug my shoulder and say, I don't really know, it just sort of does. And, and it's proprietary stuff from the company, so they're not exactly releasing all their data. But even the, the, the company that makes this, they don't really understand exactly how it works. So our thought is that it interacts with that afferent bladder to bladder reflex, and it sort of occupies the bandwidth on the nerve, uh, just like you know, rubbing something that hurts will occupy that bandwidth so you don't feel that pain. Um, but it also reinforces that leash signal. And so we know that uh, it, that leash signal may start at only 60% of filling to really increase its output. So if you can increase that leash signal, that can be really valuable for patients. Um, and then the other thing that's interesting is it, it may suppress what's called over-awareness of the bladder. And these are, are actually patients' sort of understanding of how full they are. They may be hyper-aware and just having this inner stim replaced may suppress that afferent signal. Uh, it's interesting that it's, it's indicated for overactive bladder, but it's also indicated for non-obstructive urinary retention. And, and this is sort of even muddier. Uh, it's a really unclear mechanism of action, um, but maybe it allows the central nervous system to more completely relax the bladder outlet. But it, it, works, it works quite well, and, and it really recruits a fair amount of neuron density. Um, it's a surgery that's put in in two stages. Uh, the first stage is just implanting this electrical lead, which goes through the sacrum through existing foramen and lays alongside the nerves that control the bladder. Um, and, and we give them a temporary pacemaker that they wear for a week or two. And, and if they see dramatic improvement, we'll implant that pacemaker looking thing um, and, and everything will be internalized. And, and we can really see some great improvement in this it's a, again a very low risk procedure and, and different than Botox. Once it's in, you know, it usually doesn't have to be repeated.
All right, so that's OAB. So let's move on to the prostate. And, and I'm going to speed up a little bit here because I think most of you know that the prostate is what the prostate is and what it's done, what it does. Um, and just sort of how BPH progression works. Some people have seen these slides before and you can see the urethra just getting squeezed there by the prostate as it enlarges outwardly and inwardly. Um, and, and again, thinking about how this really affects patients back to earlier in our talk, this is this is really dramatic. If you imagine the difference with BPH, they're avoiding outdoor sports, they're avoiding going to the movies, they're having bad sleep, they're avoiding driving for more than a few hours, they're not drinking enough, maybe they're getting kidney stones or having constipation, and, and it sort of becomes this cycle of problems. But it really does change a patient's quality of life. And I think as urologists, we've intuitively known that long-term BPH causes damage, but we really didn't have very good data for it. And, and that's starting to improve now. We've got some uh, bladder pressure things that can be used at home um, rather than having patients come in and be catheterized in order to understand their bladder pressure. But uh, this is a really interesting uh, piece of data. This was recently 50,000 patients sort of natural history, just sort of understanding their voiding mechanics. And, and you can see their ages there. And what you see is as BPH increases, and of course, these are all men, initially the, the bladder will compensate for this and you'll have this increased bladder pressure and that allows sort of the voiding symptoms to be kept at bay. But with prolonged bladder outlet obstruction, and again, I think about the heart a lot when I'm thinking about the bladder, um, you get this decompensated bladder and the age at which that happens on average is about 62. And then after that, you see the bladder pressure declining. These are then people marching down that diminished contractility curve. And what you can see here, the age is on the bottom and I know it's a little bit small, but at the top, you can see this is the bladder pressure. And initially there's a compensation area and then there's a decompensation curve. And what you'll see is the flow really starting to markedly drop off and the voided volume dropping off. And of course, if they're not voiding as much from a volume perspective, they're going to go more often. And, and this is sort of the reflection of that. Their post void residual volume is going to increase. This is a, I hope this works. This is a, a, what I find to be a really fascinating group of videos looking at BPH. So this is a cystoscopic video and this is in looking at the prostate. You can see these sort of curtains of prostate tissue. And as a urologist, I look at this and I think, oh, this is sort of obstructive looking. It's narrowing. These curtains are closing. Uh, there's some great European results. But you can see that during normal voiding, the, the lateral lobes are really open and the bladder neck looks open. And what they look so Dark actually really is. You can see the bladder's dark space beyond. And so this really gives us an idea of what's happening normally. On this next slide, what you're going to see is BPH and its effect. And so if you imagine these curtains, they open nicely here. But imagine if you had all this extra tissue sort of just behind the curtain and you try to open the curtain, there may not be any space for it to actually open. And so and what you'll see is the, the, the lateral lobes that are almost spasming, really trying to open. Sorry, but that's going. They're really trying to open. I think I may have put the wrong video in there. Oh, I apologize. The wrong video made it in there. But uh, what you would have seen is is the the lobes just not opening well. And then this final video is what we see as a median look where there's been some growth upward from the bladder floor. And this is really an obstructive phenomenon. Okay, so. Yeah, you can see this median low just filling up. This is medication.
and as falls right back out and then they try again. And hey, Dr. So, Buncher. Yeah. Um, when you're playing the videos, it cuts out your audio. Can you just uh, yeah, yeah, go over what the videos showed and just describe sure. them? We could we could see the videos, we just couldn't hear you okay. talking over appreciate them. the feedback. So that first video, what it showed is, is that the, the prostate has these lateral curtain lights, what we call the lateral lobes, and that those are innervated and, and that they can relax open. And, and we think about it just like pulling curtains open. And uh, the second video, I apologize, didn't show well, but it shows that as tissue builds up behind that, that those curtains don't open well. And the final video shows this unique phenomenon called a median lobe of the prostate, where if you imagine, you know, these normally you've got these two curtains potentially closing, but if you imagine you have tissue coming up from underneath, I don't know if you can see my hands here, but there's sort of this valve-like phenomenon. And, and so that picture of prostate enlargement is very medication refractory and it's it's just a true physical obstruction and there's no way to treat that without getting rid of that big ball of tissue which you sort of saw that indiana jones like phenomenon of that ball just rolling down that urethra and so you know thinking about bph treatment we've got symptom reducers like tadalafil and, and even oab meds we've got prostate shrinkers like Proscar and Avidar, and we've got relaxers, which are classically just the alpha blockers. And so we do have different medications that can all be used to, to manage that phenomenon, but ultimately many patients will progress beyond that, or they may even just have that median load phenomenon. So we do have surgical interventions, and, and I think about those surgical interventions as, as really twofold. You've got opportunities to really just dig a hole. And that's TERP. That's what you might have heard as green light or some of these other laser treatments or holmium lasers, or, or uh, there are some folks in the community who do resume. Uh, there's a new thing coming down the pike called aqua beam. But all of these treatments are, you know, just like anything, you're digging a hole. And it doesn't matter if you're digging that with a shovel or a backhoe. You know, at the end of the day, a hole is a hole. And, and the tool that you use really, for the most part, doesn't matter. And all of these sort of hole digging, extirpative type surgeries have, for the most part, the same benefits, but also the same risks. And so this is, on the left, you can see this is sort of what TERP is, is trying to do, or all these procedures are trying to do. They are removing the adenoma from the prostate and leaving the capsule intact. And you can see this picture is actually what a TERP looks like. It's this arc uh, of uh, a metal loop with electrocautery becoming this hot knife through butter and, and digging a hole. And, and, and TERP is great. It's really valuable. Um, but the downside of it is it can be very destructive. And, and so these folks can have a, a prolonged uh, recovery period of six weeks or eight weeks and they've got some risk to the sphincter mechanism and they've got some sexual dysfunction and and it has to be done under anesthesia for the most part the alternative is, is uro lift which which is different it's not digging a hole it's really just trying to open the curtains so it's pulling back these lateral lobes and remember that median lobe picture uro lift is less effective for that median lobe phenomenon because it's really built to pull back these curtains. And so it uses these implants to pull the tissue laterally and compress the prostate up against itself and sort of pin it in this unobstructed phenomenon or unobstructed position. And, and this is what it looks like. On the left, you can see that's the prostate curtains or the prostate lateral lobes moving inwardly. And on the right, you can see this is a nice open prostate channel. And you can even get the idea that something may be pulling the tissue more laterally towards the right side of the screen. And that's where that implant is placed. And so, you know, we, like everything, are, are always worried about which is better or, or patients want to know or providers want to know or we want to know. And so the things we think about are efficacy. And these are the variables we're looking at. Symptom score, does it reduce their post-void residual and or does it prevent a need for something else? Thinking about safety and we're thinking about cost and we're thinking about the cost for the patient too. How quickly do they get back to work? And, and so the Eurolift system I think is really great 
for getting folks back to work quickly. And this is how it works. But unfortunately, it's not quite as efficacious as a TERP or a whole digging procedure. And so when we're thinking about things, we have to think about it in that phenomenon, like how is this for all the patients or, or, or how is it fitting in this particular patient's lifestyle? And it's a quick, easy procedure um, and it does open things up, but it doesn't really reduce things completely. And you can see on this slide how there's still some element of those curtains there, but a good tool to have. Um, Resume is, I just want to touch on that. This is sort of how it works because I know it's out there in our community and it's less well understood. It uses uh, water vapor or steam to heat the water and destroy prostate tissue via heating and, and that sort of sloughing of tissue. And, and uh, this unfortunately needs a catheter for about a week afterwards. But the nice thing is it could theoretically be done in the office and it is a destructive hole digger, uh, but I think in my hands, I don't see a lot of value in having somebody with a catheter for a week just to avoid an, uh, an anesthesia. But it, that is, I think, the best role for this particular uh, treatment. Um, I do want to sort of not switch gears, but but sort of change about how we, we think about things and just put up a couple of scenarios and help folks realize that the complaints that they come in with are helpful but we really have to put that in perspective. So going back to our first slide where we talked about you know, our history and physical, this is where we're sort of putting it all together. So scenario one is a 56 year old male. He's got frequency, he's got nocturia, he's got urgency, and he's gonna see his doctor and he's gonna get a new prescription. And I would submit that almost everybody is gonna get an alpha blocker, probably Flomax. And I, I think that's very reasonable. Um, but if we change, the only thing we change is, is the gender, you know, of course that person's not gonna get an alpha blocker. I think that they're probably gonna get treated for an infection often. And I'll see this a lot where women, unfortunately, often get labeled as UTI anytime they have these types of symptoms, even though it's not often and it may just be dysfunction. And the man, if they if they you know are refractory, I think they're just going to get more BPH treatment. It's just like they're they are a prostate until somebody else sort of shows them a new way. And I just want people to think about if someone's not getting better, maybe doubling down isn't the right thing. Maybe it's time to expand and think about those components. And are you missing something? And and maybe it's just not BPH all the time for men. And, and for the women, I think what would happen is second line, they would get OAB medications. And I think that's not an unreasonable thought. And I think we sort of do a better job with the women because we don't sort of get fixated on the prostate. But we fail to think about things like prolapse or, or maybe there is an obstructive phenomenon there. And then I think if we really change the age down to a young person and put the same symptoms in there, I think they're gonna get antibiotics too, and then they're gonna get this STI workup. And, and I, again, I'm not saying that that's wrong, but it's interesting, I, I think those that work with geriatrics, uh, the STI population, the geriatric population is exploding, but I very rarely see folks getting evaluated for that. But if there's a young person, you know, they might have 10 chlamydia tests on their record, and they might've gotten all these antibiotics, but nobody has thought about maybe this is a urethral stricture or maybe this is a, a bladder phenomenon. And then the other interesting thing is because they're a male, a lot of times then the next thing they'll get is a BPH medication. And, and this is, you know, these guys are in their 30s and, and they're not getting, you know, this is not a BPH phenomenon. So I, I do think it is valuable to sort of have some of our preconceived notions in there because lots of times, there is some value to understanding that, you know, a middle-aged man probably has some prostate, middle-aged woman may have some OAB or maybe some infections if she's postmenopausal. A young man, certainly we have to think about, is this an infection? But I think we also have to think about it more broadly and more intelligent. So, you know, why do these all get different treatments? Yes, age and gender do make a difference, but we are biased. And we have to remember that men can have OAB 
and young men can have OAB and women get infections, but they also may have OAB or they may have obstruction. And so I think part of the problem is that as a, as a group of, of healthcare providers, we've really had insufficient data and, and PCPs just don't have a lot of data at their disposal to try to make that decision intelligently. So uh, I had an orthopedic friend in, in residency and he introduced me to this term called JUBS, which stands for jacked up body syndrome. And so, you know, you gotta think about which, which component has JUBS? You know, is it the bladder, is it the prostate, is it both? Is this a behavioral issue? And so what are the tools that we have? Well, in our office, we've got anatomical tools. We've got a cystoscopy to look for urethral stricture, to look at the prostate. And you can see obstructed versus not obstructive there. We can look for things that are irritating the bladder, like bladder stones or bladder cancer. Very helpful anatomical tool. And we can see that's what that median lobe might look like on cystoscopy here. You can really see the difference. This is someone on the right that may respond to Flomax, and this is someone who's not going to. And if you don't have this tool, how are you going to know that? Uh, we have also some great functional tools, and, and this is urodynamics here, and it looks complicated, and unfortunately, it's a little bit of a hard sell for patients but it's, it uses catheters in either the rectum or the vagina and in the bladder to measure pressure. And it measures filling pressure and it looks for any abnormal complicate or abnormal contractions consistent with overactive bladder. It'll show us the bladder capacity and it'll show us the voiding pressure, what I call the bladder oomph. Like is, is this a good bladder push power or is it an a contractile bladder? And it also gives us the flow rate and we can put some EMG stickers around the anus and actually pick up the sphincter activity or pick up pelvic floor dysfunction. So very helpful test. Unfortunately, a little bit spendy and kind of a hard sell for some for some patients. Um, but I, again, a very nice adjunct for us so that so you guys can understand some of what we're doing and some of what these terms may mean when you get our reports. And then my favorite tool is this one. It's a bladder diary. It's super low tech, it is super cheap, and it is invaluable. So really what I'm just asking folks to do is take home something that they can, that we give them that they can record how much they void and, and then to also give us a rough idea of what they drink and when, and then just put it on a chart for me so I can understand maybe this is a problem that's polyuria, Maybe it's polydipsia. Is there a difference between night versus day? It's going to give me the volume per void, and it's really going to help me understand how this all plays out. Because instead of a patient saying, I go kind of a lot, and I think it's kind of small volume or normal, it really gives me nice data, and it's real data, real life data, not just a one time they come and I get a post void residual. Uh, so, so I think this is sort of my favorite tool and and this is really a, a nice way to help work up the nocturia in general um, and make sure that it is a difference between day versus night so when i see these folks i'm using the urodynamics maybe i'm using cystoscopy and i may use voiding diary in addition to history and physical to try to put together a complete picture of which of these components are working which ones aren't is it a behavioral issue and try to unravel what can become quickly a pretty complicated series of, of issues. Um, I, I will be the first person to say that lower urinary tract symptoms is not always easy. It can be very frustrating. There can actually be a lot of stuff going on. And certainly as folks get older, those things start to combine and, and become challenging. Uh, but fortunately, there's pretty low risk to try. And we talked to the residents early, uh, earlier in the year, and, and I really encouraged them, and, and I would encourage all of you, um, you know, most of these medications are pretty low risk for a few weeks or a few months. Um, you've got some tools, ultrasound, or even voiding diary that you can use to try to figure this out. And, and then we're always here, um, and we're happy to see anyone, but I think it's a fun area where if, if you have the desire to sort of see the cause and effect of things that you're doing without a lot of risk, it's a neat area where you, you can maybe just hit the mark and, 
And there's nothing that's uh, more fun than having a patient who comes in and they've got OAB and they've been on all these other things and, and you give them some ditropan and they're so happy and they think you're some sort of wizard, but, but you're really just expanding that component evaluation. I think thinking about the whole patient is really critical um, not to belabor sort of all the points that we learn, but I think there's a reason why we learn about all of those uh, sort of history and physical components is, is because they really matter. So obstructive sleep apnea and behavior, where they have lower extremity edema, that really matters. Um, and then age and sex, they do play a role and there is important sort of generalizations that we have about those folks, but we shouldn't just rely only on those things. We should expand and, and again, think about all the components. And then I think one of the harder things it is for us as physicians, and certainly for me, is to try to set expectations. Um, this can be really complicated. You, you could have a patient who has bladder to bladder reflex and OAB, but at the same time has a poor push power and has BPH, you know, and maybe has some cognitive derangements with some dementia, and all of a sudden it's really complicated to try to unwind all these things. And so it is important, I think, to help folks understand that it may not just be you see the urologist are going to give you a different pill and, and that's going to be that. Um, they may need some invasive evaluations with cystoscopy or urodynamics, and we may need to actually work on multiple components in order, order to sort of move that needle. But it is, as you saw earlier, really valuable to treat them from a quality of life perspective. And, and ultimately, um, they're really happy if you can figure it out for them. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for their time. I know it was a long presentation. I don't know where we are in terms of time, but uh, I'd love to take questions and I'm always available for things on the side as well. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Boncher, so much. Really appreciate that. Uh, and I am mindful of the hour, uh, but if you do have time, we would, would like to ask you a, a question or two. Um, yeah. So I, I I liked this idea of thinking beyond just BPH uh, as, uh, in, you know, say a middle-aged man presenting with urologic symptoms. And so what, so is there a strategy for distinguishing between the two or is it mainly just a, you know, try, like, do you just try BPH meds first and, oh, it's not working, so maybe let's reconsider OAB or, or what is your strategy for trying to distinguish between the two? Yeah, I think that's uh, a great question and I think that's probably true. I, I, I think the post-void residual volume is probably my big kicker. And so, you know, if you don't have that, an ultrasound would be great. But I think if their PVR is, you know, under 60 mLs or, or two ounces and, and they're having a lot of frequency, for instance, it's a tough sell to think that that extra two ounces that they're withholding is going to, you know, if their bladder capacity is, let's say, even low, 10 ounces, and that would take a total of five voids to add up to one additional void. So if they're having a lot of frequency, the numbers don't just really add up there. And so someone with a low PVR, I would definitely say, hey, maybe this is OAB. Um, the other thing I think is helpful is the history. So I think a lot of these folks will talk about, oh, I was the kid in school or I've always gone a lot. Um, or or you know, so you might be seeing them in their 50s because they didn't have insurance before. Or they didn't realize it or you were the first person to ask them, but it may go back 30 or 40 years. And those guys are often OAB. And then I, I think the other kicker would be the presence of any comorbidities. And, and for me, the most common far and away is diabetes. And, and OAB is the number one urologic anomaly in diabetics. It, it's, a, it's a continuum where as they lose that neurologic function from the diabetes, they'll initially have OAB and eventually they'll get this diminished contractility atony picture, but out of the gate, it's OAB. Excellent, thank you. And uh, on kind of a similar note, so if you, I, I love this phrase that you used, uh, you know, if somebody's not getting better, maybe doubling down on your treatment isn't the right strategy. Um, I'm curious, do you have, or would you recommend to primary care physicians uh, primarily, like a, a kind of algorithm that you use or that you would suggest using? Obviously taking a good history is gonna be first, but are yeah. there, you know, a couple of first uh, passes or tests or uh, medications even that you recommend as uh, sort of algorithmically as you're evaluating somebody for
for lower urinary tract symptoms? Yeah, uh, I would say in my perspective, it's, it's only anecdotal that folks get better, for instance, by taking Flomax up to 0 0.8 from 0 0.4 or, or making it BID. I think the data would show that most likely you're just increasing the side effect profile. And then from a finasteride perspective, for the most part, those medications aren't designed for symptomatic improvement. They're really designed to prevent progression. So, so the big outcomes for, for 5-ARIs like Avidart or Finasteride have been need for future TERP or development of bladder stones or recurrent infections. Um, and so the sort of preventing that progression is really their mainstay in terms of usage. There is a little bit of synergy between alpha blockers and, and 5-ARIs, but, but 5-ARIs are pretty unlikely to move the symptom needle. So I think if you're, I, I think, you know, to me, if they're over 50 and they're a man, I, I put them on BPH meds out of the gate because it just, it's the most common thing and it's probably contributing at some level. And then beyond that, I, I think I would probably try OAB meds. Um, and, and then the, the caution is, if it truly is like that median lobe and they're really obstructed, the OAB meds as a side effect can have some medication induced diminished push power. So if you've got a tight you know, channel and you take away the head of pressure, they may actually get worse. And that's actually a great clue. And you can say, okay, like not only did you not get better, you, you got worse. I think this is probably, you know, severe or, or one of these unique parameters for BPH. You, you probably need, you know, surgical eval. But I think it's pretty low risk to, to start, you know, an anticholinergic or, or if they have a, a, a contraindication like glaucoma to start them on mirbetric. And, and I think that's probably my algorithm is, is Flomax. And if they're not getting better, I'll put them on OAB met. That's great. Well, Dr. Buncher, again, thank you so much for the time. Thank you for being our grand finale to the season of Grand Rounds. And thank you to all you in the audience for participating and joining us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in the fall. Have a wonderful summer. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, guys. Cheers.